Today, I would like to speak to you about the sacrament of baptism. It's an incredibly important sacrament, and the church does teach that it is necessary for salvation. When we speak about the sacrament being necessary for salvation, we always have to remember that we're speaking about a relationship, not a hoop to jump through in order to get the prize. If that's how we begin to interpret the law of God, then we're already falling away from God's intention of us understanding it. And so when we hear the word necessary for salvation, let's not panic and let's remember that we're speaking about a God of love who wants us to enter into a relationship not into a relationship of a bunch of technicalities. Now, I don't want us to take a mile with that inch that I just gave you either. It's very dangerous for us to see God's law as so flexible that we can just opt out of it if we choose. So what does the church mean when she says that baptism is necessary for salvation? What does it mean for unborn children who die or children who die that were born, but they were not able to be baptized. Well, the word necessary is a nuanced term within the church, and we have to understand it as the church herself understands it. And so, first of all, a good example might be looking at the Summa Theologica with St. Thomas Aquinas, when he speaks about the necessity of confirmation for the salvation of souls. Within it, he responds to an objection, basically, where someone asserts the idea that what if a child dies before they could receive it, but they wanted to receive it? And his response is, a person can still be saved as long as they don't reject the sacrament out of malice. That is to say that they know that this is a sacrament from God, but out of a hatred for God, they reject it. So that reminds us again of that word necessary is in regard to a relationship with God. And malice is something that can prevent our relationship with God to grow. Another exceptional situation that we might find are the catechumenate. And so those are those people who are preparing to become fully initiated Catholics within the church. If they die before they receive the sacraments, the church will offer them a fully Catholic burial. And this is to indicate that they have received baptism, but by desire. And so that's an actual term that we've used. Biblically speaking, we might think of the good thief who died on the cross before he could receive baptism. And Jesus promised that he would inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's not as if Jesus said, hold on, wait a minute, we got some rules about this. Let's just pause this whole crucifixion thing and we'll baptize you. No, Jesus understands that there are extraordinary situations, including even martyrdom. If a person wants to become Catholic, but is baptized in blood, we call to mind those particular innocents during that Christmas time when Herod sent out his military to kill the children. They're all considered saints, even though they never made a choice of their own and were not baptized. Of course, we do know that they were of the Jewish faith and they were innocent. But was the stain of original sin washed away? And these are some questions that we have to really look into carefully. What we know about original sin is that it's inherited from one father to another. It's passed on or propagated from our first parents to us right now. And the type of blame that comes with original sin is not the blame of personal sin. It's the blame of being a community that has rejected God. It's a type of corporate guilt or organic guilt with a community, but not as individuals. And we know that it's within God's heart to forgive this sin. And so God is giving us the ordinary way to enter into that grace through the sacrament of baptism. But that doesn't mean that God is limited to what he would prefer to be the ordinary means of salvation and has in fact defined to be as such. And so we can't get legalistic with this, but we also have to be careful not to take a mile with this inch that I just offered you. We know that sometimes when we say that, oh, well, it technically isn't absolutely necessary then for salvation, therefore we don't, you just don't need to baptize anybody. This is disregarding and becoming indifferent to what God does intend for his church. And that's a form of malice. 
When God speaks, we're called to listen if we truly love him. And God is asking us to take very seriously the sacraments and to, in fact, extend them to all corners of the world. And so that's actually the Great Commission. And so if we as Christians don't evangelize and spread out the message of God and the gift of the sacraments, especially through baptism, then that indifference can have a cost because that's malicious indifference towards God. And so why is baptism so important from the point of view of a relationship? That's the point I would like to stress for the remainder of this video. The sacrament of baptism speaks to us of the Father's love in particular. We are being adopted as children of God. And in fact, we believe an indelible mark is being placed on our soul that can never be undone, which is why we only baptize once. Once that mark is there, there is nothing that will take it off. God is changing our nature, and by that, he is changing our identity. And what kind of identity are we receiving? It's an identity of being marked as a child of God. This is a dignity that not even the angels have. Now, when we speak about being children of God, we're not talking about being his creatures. We already were that. We were created in the image and likeness of God. As wonderful as that is, this is even more intense. And so we have to make sure that when we hear that phrase, I am a child of God, that it doesn't just become a hallmark or a statement that we gloss over. This is the most intense gift that we could possibly receive from our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father is choosing to love us just as he loves his only Son. Through grace, not through nature. A very important distinction. We're never going to be in our own essence and nature, God. But through grace, God is extending to us a divine love. And we believe that as Christians, this leads to, in eternal life, something called theosis or deification. That through grace, we are so united to God that we become him. That we're so united to him through grace that we take on the dignity of God himself. And that's because the Father is loving us like his only son who is God. And so when we become children of God, we are wrapped up and in this whirlwind of love between the Father and the Son. A love that was so powerful between the eternal Son and the eternal Father that it generated for, from all eternity the Holy Spirit, who is love itself. And so when we take time to reflect on the gift that's actually being bestowed upon us, it is not a creaturely gift, it is a divine gift. God is loving us with such incredible intimacy. And what's amazing about it is that God the Son never sins, right? But we do. And so how could it be that God the Father could love us like his only son? How could that ever be the case when we're morally totally different? But this is God's plan of redemption for us. That when we reject him, he accepts us and seeks us out even more. And so God's generosity is beyond words. And re really, when we take time to reflect on this gift, you'll find that words will fall short of praising God for it. So parents bring their children, or as adults, or later on in life, we come towards the sacrament. But we begin it and offer it at infancy. And the reason why the church does this is because we testify to the belief that God wants these children to be his own. And that second of all, this sacrament isn't about a personal decision primarily on our part, but it's primarily about what God intends for our lives. And so we're not meriting this relationship. Baptism is not just a personal testimony of our own faith. It's not a symbol in regard to our relationship with God. We believe at this very moment of baptism, God is imprinting something in our soul and identifying us in the kingdom of God as his beloved children. This is an incredible gift. And if we understand that heaven is all about an intimate relationship with God, we can therefore understand why we would say it's necessary for salvation. That if we want to have that relationship with God in heaven, then we need to enter in through the baptismal waters. Now there's a lot more that we can say, but I'd like to end this video reflecting on the responsibilities that come with this incredible gift. Because we are inheriting 
the love of the Father for the only Son. We also inherit His responsibilities and vocation in a unique way for each one of us. But we inherit a threefold vocation that Jesus Christ had when He was in this life. We inherit His responsibility to be king, to be priest, and to be prophet. These three realities are communicated to us when the oils are placed on the child's head and on the breastplate. Oil was really only used uh, as a special uh, marking for kings, priests, and prophets. It was also used for healing, but in this particular venue, we're speaking about a very dignified being. And so God is dignified, and because God has marked our soul with his dignity, the son's dignity, we are receiving that chrism oil and that oil of catechumenate. And so these oils are blessed by the bishop, and they commission us in that child to know its dignity, but to also understand its identity. Its identity now is Christ the priest, Christ the prophet, and Christ the king. And this is in fact what the church is. The church is the hands and feet of Christ. And this child becomes a member of the body of Christ. And so when we receive the sacrament of baptism, we are God's own instruments, just like Jesus was when he was 33 years old, dying on the cross. We become his arms and his feet, dying on the cross, forgiving our enemies and extending to them the good news of forgiveness and Jesus Christ's mercy and love and truth. And so it's very important for us to understand our identity as, in a sense, the hands and feet of Christ as an embodiment, a sacramental embodiment of who Jesus was. So now apply that to your relationships with others. How does your words and your conversations illuminate what Christ is like? How does your service to the poor and your proclamation of the gospel to those who don't know God, how does it represent Christ himself? So that's the prophetic nature. How, did, how are you willing to sacrifice your own life for the Father's will and out of service for the Father's will in your neighbor? That's the priestly ministry. And finally, kingship. You have authority. I don't like it when I hear lay people say, well, I'm just a lay person, I'm not a priest. You have been given the authority of Jesus Christ, maybe not in an administrative way in the hierarchy of the church, but you have been given the authority to speak on his behalf, even to authority figures such as bishops, priests, and deacons. We see that eloquently with St. Catherine of Siena, a lay woman who was able to tell the Pope and reprove him to get back to Rome and be a man. And so what we see is within the laity, a very true call to be prophetic, to exercise their authority spiritually, and in terms of telling and informing our consciences on what's right and wrong. And of course, to offer sacrifice, a sacrifice of a contrite spirit, but also a sacrifice of our very own body out of laying it down for Jesus Christ, just as he did for us. So brothers and sisters, this is an incredible sacrament. There's an incredible gift attached to it but there's also an incredible responsibility. It means if you have been baptized, you are called to be a priest, prophet, and king. Scandal happens when we are marked as a Christian, but we do the exact opposite of what Christ might do. All of us are gonna fall short of that, but we have to remember to avoid that scandal because as Christians, we are the physical, visible embodiment of what Christ is like through the sacramental grace of baptism. And if we fail at that, then we're falling short of our calling, and we're also giving people a twisted version of who Jesus is. Now, none of us are going to be able to do this all on our own, and that's why it's so important for us to have the gift of the Holy Spirit stirred within our heart. We trust that God has chosen us for a reason and that he can use us. Even when we fail, we ask for forgiveness and remind people of our fallen nature. But we make sure that we're humbly doing this and seeking to allow God's Spirit to speak through ourselves rather than our own agenda and our own idea of what God's will is. We have to ultimately allow God to speak for himself. And he does that beautifully through the universal magisterium of the church and through the scriptures. 
God bless you as we reflect on the sacrament of baptism. It is truly necessary for salvation, and if people know that, they are called to pursue that. And we call to mind all those who may not be baptized, and we place them into the loving, hopeful hands of our Heavenly Father. God bless you. Thank you.